Hello and welcome to this KubeCon and CloudNativeCon preview on theCUBE. I love the naming conventions. I'm Dave Vellante, Chief Analyst with Cube Research, and I'm joined by Joe Fernandez, VP and GM of Hybrid Platforms at Red Hat. Red Hat's the gold standard for open source contributions and has the premier business model and is really the envy of open source community. Uh, Joe, thanks for spending some time with us. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having us, Dave. Uh, you bet. All right, so Red Hat's a diamond sponsor uh, at the, the, the CNCF Cloud Native Con, uh, KubeCon. Of course, you're an anchor sponsor of the Cube as well. Thank you for that. You guys are really always supporting the open source community and helping us educate and inspire people. What are you looking forward to at this year's event? Yeah, so um, yeah, we've been part of the Kubernetes community since the beginning, right? Um, I think it's coming up on, nine, just hit nine years this summer since oh. Kubernetes was launched. Uh, it'll be the 10 year anniversary next year. Um, I think KubeCon's been going on just as long. So, you know, first and foremost, you know, looking to see, you know, what are people working on in Kubernetes, right? That's still, you know, the anchor project. But what's been happening is, you know, there's this whole vibrant ecosystem of projects that continues exploding around Kubernetes, right? So, uh, you know, different areas, whether that's management or security or AI or, or you know, dev, DevOps and so forth. And so, really interested to see that because as Kubernetes has gotten more stable, the pace of change has continued to, you know, slow down. That's a good thing. That means more stability for the core. Um, but then what's taken its place is just a growing number of open source projects and new innovations that are solving problems, you know, in overall in this cloud native ecosystem. It's definitely getting more stable. You say that, you know, I, I remember originally, you go back, you know, eight or nine years, I mean, it was pretty basic and it was, focus, the focus was on simplicity and getting adoption up. And then and, and they made some, the committers, the original committers made some, you know, tough decisions. Let's, let's mature it over time. Let's not try to do too much at once. Right. And, and now you're seeing the, the impact of that. You mentioned projects. Are there any specific projects that you're really excited about or you want to double click on when you're, you're in Chicago? Yeah, I mean, so, um, so yeah, again, a ton of uh, interesting projects going on, right? Like from projects that are close to the core around observability, Prometheus and uh, things like Jaeger for, uh, for tracing and so forth, op the open tracing project. Um, things around DevOps, right? So uh, Tekton, uh, for, which is what we use to drive OpenShift pipelines. Argo CD um, is an interesting project. We're seeing a lot of uh, adoption of GitOps and, and Argo's right in the center of that. Um, and then newer things around security, things like, um, uh, 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 you know, things around secure, sub securing the software supply chain. So SigStore is a, a project that we're involved in around, uh, you know, around artifact signing and, and helping you build out software bill of materials. So, Really, it's not one thing. It's just yeah, you know, just a, a wide assortment. Yeah, you mentioned several, and, and yeah. I mean, I remember when Argo first hit the scene, and we said, "Wow, this has a lot of potential." You yeah. know, Sigstore was was well um, excited about that. Joe just got back from a customer trip in Europe, and remember, in 2023, we saw this continued deterioration of spending expectations from CIOs. So, you know, we've seen a significant focus on on efficiency. So, so Joe, my question is, how is the community addressing? First of all, you're hearing that. You yeah. probably heard it on your trip. How's the community addressing that? Maybe how Red Hat is helping customers sort of save money in these you know, yeah. tough times. Yeah, I mean, what, what struck me, you mentioned the trip, right? Like what struck me is you know, a couple of things. One is just how, you know, uh, how explosive the growth continues to be, right? So customers who started out with maybe you know, a single Kubernetes cluster or a small number of clusters now have continued to grow those clusters and grow the number of clusters as they bring more applications and uh, more use cases to, uh, to the platform. And so, so they need help managing at scale, right? So, so we're invested in you know, multi-cluster management solutions, um, observability, as I mentioned, helping customers manage uh, the scale that they'll need to meet the needs of their applications. Um, the other thing is then, you know, a lot of focus around automation, right? So again, I mentioned um, uh, I mentioned Argo CD. Uh, I must have heard uh, GitOps, you know, from at least two thirds of those customers, and they're using it in different ways. So they're leveraging uh, GitOps uh, to automate the configuration and deployment of uh, applications that they're bringing onto Kubernetes uh, uh, through OpenShift, and then they're using it to deploy OpenShift clusters themselves, right? So infrastructure as code type use cases for um, for uh, you know automating the deployment of new clusters, uh, addressing things like disaster recovery scenarios. If a cluster you know uh, goes down, how do you, how do you rebuild it, reconstruct it? And so um, super interested in that because you know obviously people have been doing CI/CD and automation for for a while, but you know, there's new solutions now, new approaches that are more, you know, Kubernetes native, cloud native, and, and you know, it's another area where people are modernizing. 
Yeah, and you mentioned multi-cluster at scale. I mean, again, that's an example of early on, the community really wasn't really focused on that, but now it's, it's critical in recovery. This is so complicated, recovering from multi-clusters at, yeah. at scale. And that's something that the community has been really hard at work on hardening, you know, Kubernetes. And it's just, that helps it just even go even more mainstream, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and then, you know, within the cluster, things like, you know, what's inhibiting scale, right? So there's been a lot of advances in Kubernetes networking, right? Making sure that, um, you know, networking uh, across all the, you know, containers and services in your cluster scales to the to the rate that you need it, but then also, you know, getting traffic into the cluster, right? Your, your ingress, your load balancers, and then across multiple clusters, right? So, um, so yeah, so scaling in terms of how you're managing it, but then also scaling uh, the capabilities of the platform itself. So you mentioned security, supply chain security, obviously a big topic. Yeah. Compliance is another one. It's, they're kind of two sides of the same coin, privacy and, and, and compliance and security. What are you seeing there? Yeah, so, um, so, you know, they do go hand in hand, right? So, so we, you know, obviously Red Hat made an investment in this space with our acquisition of StackRox that, that drives our advanced cluster security solution. Uh, we also brought um, advanced cluster management as a solution over from IBM. That's part of our OpenShift portfolio. So a couple things. First, you know, looking at security from uh, really uh, from the applications all the, you know, all the way down to the, you know, the core uh, uh platform itself, Kubernetes, uh, Linux, Linux kernel, and so forth. So, um, so that's what we're doing, uh, you know, with uh, ACM and ACS is basically helping people manage um, you know, to ensure the security and the uh, the compliance of their platforms. Whether you know whatever if they have CIS benchmarks, PCI compliance, and so forth, they want to make sure that they're running on a compliant platform. Um, and then you know on the applications, you know, moving from sort of you know just vulnerability scanning to to uh, of your container images to being able to uh, look at uh, running containers and, and look for vulnerabilities there, but then also shifting that left to build that into your CI processes. And so, so what we're seeing is, you know, things like uh, Tecton and Argo come together with uh, SigStore uh, to create a, you know more automated process for you know securing the supply chain, so that when you're building those images, you're building them securely up front. And then you're you know you're building uh, you know software bill of materials around the contents of those images so that you can ensure that uh, is secure once you put it out to production. And simpler. This is a critical point because in the cloud created a new layer of, of kind of the first line of defense, if you will, in, in security. And it, and it also created more complexity because you got shared responsibility models, you got yeah. multiple clouds, and then coming into the organization. You know, DevOps is being asked to do the, the development team being asked to do more, you know, shift left, you yeah. call it, right? So securing the code, it's kind of not their wheelhouse traditionally. So it's got to be simple. It's got to be, you know, help them be as accurate as, as possible. What's the sentiment amongst developers? Do they, is the sentiment like, okay, I got another thing to do. Or yeah. is it, hey, I understand the importance of, I know they understand the importance of it, but it's got to be made simpler and that's really the initiative. Yeah, isn't it? I mean I think we're putting a lot on developers these days, right? Like, you know, we moved from dev and ops to the whole DevOps movement, then we're like, okay, now it's DevSecOps, you got to think about security and so forth. Um, and and you know, it really puts a lot uh, on a, on the developer's plate uh, when they have to start thinking about all these things because ultimately their focus is how do I build this application to solve this business problem? You know, that's that's what they're thinking about first and foremost, not all the operational or security concerns, right? So I think that's where a, a platform approach can help. Um, you've seen that in the rise of the, you know, platform engineering as, you know, as both a, a discipline and, and something that many customers are asking about. Um, so the platform engineering team's job is to provide uh, platforms and services to those developers so that they can, again, focus on, uh, you know, what they do best and leverage the platform and a platform-based approach uh, to, uh, to manage things like, you know, operational concerns, security concerns, scale, and so forth. Um, so that they, they don't have as much on their plate and they, they can get to productivity much faster. So you think we're going to see the DevSec data AI ops soon? Is that, is, is that <laughs> no, what's coming? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, I think you know, AI just adds another wrinkle to that. What were the conversations like in Europe around AI? Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I think a, AI, obviously, you know, it's, you know, with the, um, you know, chat GPT, generative AI, lar large language models. I mean, AI has been around for a long time, but, you know, over the last year, it's certainly exploded. A lot of that focus right now has been on the consumer side. You know, what's Microsoft doing with OpenShift, OpenAI? What's uh, what's Google doing in response? Is this going to be built into search? So, so it's really consumer uh, oriented, uh, but we know it's going to 
have an even, you know, just as big or greater impact on the enterprise, right? So um, I think for enterprises, it's part of their modernization strategy, right? So enterprises for the last decade have been focused on how are they going to not only build new applications, but modernize the, the applications that they have in place, right? And so largely they're moving from traditional, whether it was monolithic or N-tier style architectures like Java E or .NET to new microservices, cloud native style architectures. That is still ongoing. There's still a lot more legacy applications in the enterprise than there are you know, cloud native apps. Uh, but now you, know, you have a new problem to solve, which is how can I infuse more intelligence into those apps, leveraging the data that I have and using AI as an enabler for that, right? So it becomes another characteristic uh, of the application and, and it's something that we're doing in our own application. So I have projects in both OpenShift and Ansible to bring AI in to provide a better experience to my end users. Customers want to do the same things for their applications regardless of of the industry that they're in. And, and as I mentioned up front, of course, we all know about the cost pressure, pressures these days. And it's not like the top line IT spend is, it's not like CEOs are throwing money at the IT department saying, oh yeah, go do AI. Essentially what's happening based on the data that we see from our ETR partners is people are AI spending going up. Everything else is maybe still soft, but stealing from that, yeah. you know, or trying to, so there's a lot of experimentation going on. Did you see that in, in Europe, um, that kind of, you know, focus on experimentation for AI and are, are, there, are yeah. they moving into production? Are you seeing any sort of activity in the US that gives you sort of an indication that we're going to start seeing sort of that, that AI tide lift all boats? Yeah, so I mean, I, I, th I think we'll see, uh, and you know, I can't really comment on the macro economy, but you know, certainly everybody's under you know, pressure to, to do more with less, right? And I, I think Europe's no different from what we see here in, in the States. Um, but they also know they can't stop innovating, right? So they have to make prioritization decisions and trade-offs, right? And, and nobody's, you, know, you can't just put a, a major you know, technology breakthrough like generative AI aside and say, well, I'll get to it when I can afford to, <laughs> to spend there, right? So, so yeah, I think those trade-offs you know, are happening and people are you know, figuring out how, how to free up resources and who's gonna uh, do this work and you know, whether they're gonna build or, or you know, buy uh, new uh, uh, managed services and so forth. So yeah, certainly, certainly seeing that happen, um, but then also you know, seeing that the, the same teams that are enabling those application developers are going to be asked to enable the data scientists as well, right? Today, you know, companies have hundreds, if not thousands, of developers for some of our largest customers, and so they need those teams, the DevOps teams, the platform engineering teams, to support those developers, where they in the past may have had a small number of data scientists by proportion as investment grows, those teams grow, right? And so those teams are going to need a lot of the same uh, access to infrastructure, access to tools, figuring out how to automate what they do. And so you start hearing more about MLOps types workflows. And then just like applications, they need, you know, they need to run that stuff everywhere, right? Even more so. So I think AI is you know, one of the killer workloads for the hybrid cloud because AI needs to run where your data lives and data lives everywhere. Yeah, so I wanted to ask you about your hybrid yeah. in your title. Yeah. Certainly in the pandemic, we had the force march to digital and the cloud was you know, critical and Kubernetes was critical in terms of moving workloads to the, to the cloud, super helpful. And, and now, we, I love your thoughts on this. The data that we're seeing says, well, we're kind of reaching, I wouldn't say an equilibrium. I mean, cloud's still outpacing, cloud native still, you know, and public yeah. cloud still outpacing sort of on-prem, but we're definitely seeing a more of a balanced approach and Kubernetes, of course, and containers support that that balance by yeah. sort of making it simpler to move move stuff where it belongs, right, and move the work to the to the to the data as you're as you're pointing out. What are you seeing in terms of that hybrid equilibrium? Yeah, so so you know we've been talking about open hybrid cloud now for more than a decade, right? Like you know we, you know we we're working with customers to bring them you know, help them accelerate their move of applications to the public cloud, but we always knew that there wasn't going to be one destination for all enterprise apps because enterprise customers have thousands and tens of thousands of applications. So, so we're seeing certainly growth in the cloud uh, that's outpacing growth in the data center, but we're still seeing a lot of you know, gravity in the data center. And then as people move more aggressively uh, to the public cloud, uh, you see just a growing number of multi-cloud uh, strategies. So more and more customers that I run into that not only have large contracts with one provider, say an Amazon, but but with an AWS and Azure, or Azure and Google, or you know Google and AWS and so forth, uh, IBM Cloud in that mix, Alibaba, other providers as well, regional, uh, especially in places like Europe and Asia, also. So, so multi-cloud, you know, is a thing now. Edge is becoming a thing in terms of uh, moving those workloads um, 
out to, you know, factory floor for manufacturers or out to retail locations or out to, you know, cell phone towers for our tel telco providers. Um, and so that's just on the application side. Then you basically say, okay, now you're introducing AI as an application. What's the benefit of AI, right? It's, it's working on your data, right? So if you have to collect data and ship it back to your data center or back to the closest, you know, AWS or Azure region to process it, you're incurring latency, you're incurring costs. And again, ultimately, you're, you're slowing things down, right? So people want to move those AI workloads right to where the data is generated. So, so that's, you know, again, in the edge uh, uh, example I mentioned, we're working with manufacturers like ABB and Bosch and so forth around factory floor automation and how to uh, bring uh, an edge platform to where manufacturing is happening. But ultimately, what's going to run on that platform predominantly is going to be things that work on the data that's being generated there, and that's all glad you brought AI. up edge because that that I was going to ask you that's part of your scope in, in, in hybrid, and you're seeing different infrastructure requirements. But your software, you know, can go there. Right? Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure every you know data center box is going to go there. Actually, I'm quite sure they're not. Not every data center box is going to go there. We're seeing a whole you know, suite of new types of system on chips and ARM yeah. and low cost and low power. It's a, it's a, it's a dramatically different requirement, but it's, it's interesting how open source f generally fits and certainly Red Hat's product, whether it's Linux yeah. or, or OpenShift fit in that environment as an yeah. enabler. Yeah, no, I, I tell customers all the time, right? Like I, I don't know what workloads they may run at the edge, but I know one thing that'll be right there, it's Linux, right? And you know, Red Hat's been the Linux company for 30 years, right? So, um, so Linux is going to be that, uh, that platform where, you know, that people want to run uh, for their edge workloads. Linux these days means Linux containers. Linux containers brings you to Kubernetes, right? And so, um, so we have a solution for um, both edge servers, and then we're just launching a new solution this fall called Red Hat Device Edge that allow you to run containers on edge devices, right? Um, and um, so edge devices would be IoT, IoT devices, gateways and such. Um, and again, this is what customers are, are demanding. Um, and what we need to do is figure out how do we shrink that platform down to fit the footprint where it needs to run. So, so if you're running on an edge server, that's going to be a single node uh, OpenShift Kubernetes cluster running at that location. If you're on an edge device, it might just be uh, Linux itself. So we have RHEL for Edge as part of Red Hat Device Edge where you can just bring a container directly to Linux. Or if you need Kubernetes to manage the, the, uh, those containers, uh, we have a form factor called MicroShift, which is a, you know, a tiny version of OpenShift that runs on RHEL for Edge, uh, you know, again, for those IoT device type use cases. And so, so we're definitely seeing that. And then management comes with that because you have to manage those, all those deployments at scale. I think it's one of the so, biggest trends that we're going to see in the next 10, plus years, the, the edge is going to explode. It's an enormous market. The economics are going to shift. And of course, as it always happens, it'll creep back into the enterprise and, right. and disrupt things again and open source will be there. Absolutely. <laughs> it's just a, and it's just another footprint in the hybrid cloud, right? It's just another example of the fact that applications aren't all going to run in one place. They're going to continue to, to go where they need to go to serve the needs of the business. Well, Joe, welcome back to the States. Thanks so much for spending some time with us. Really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. You bet. Okay. Q KubeCon and Cloud Native Con, November 6th through 9th in Chicago. The Cube will be there. Stop by and see us. This is Dave Vellante. We'll see you next time.